Good morning, everybody. Thank you, David. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about how to survive the future. Um, I realized when I looked at that title last night that this could be a slideshow about self-help should you face a zombie apocalypse, but it's actually not going to be. It's more about how banks, particularly established banks, need to look and cope in the future as it's coming forward. And the future is painted by the likes of Brett and others. I, I spend a lot of my time, particularly the last six to 12 months, traveling across Europe, talking to a lot of different organizations, a lot of financial organizations. And although we talk about things like, what should we do with our branches? How should digital play in that role? What about disintermediation in payments? Are we worrying about that? Bitcoin, should I have an app on the smartwatch? All these topics kind of are underpinned by some common themes and threads that come out um, and change that they, these organizations need to go through to be able to survive. And so that's, that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. I'm going to do four themes that have come out. The first is prepare for bite-sized banking. So what do I mean by bite-sized banking? Well, as, as Brett's already highlighted, the world is changing in how we interact with our finances, how we engage with our finances. No longer do you go to one place with one organization and interact in one way. Now you have all these different channels. You have smartphone, you have tablet, you have kiosk, you have smart watches, you have glasses. You still have branches and call centers. You can do it in your car. And who knows what will come next? And and the way we interact is different. Sometimes it's just snacks. Sometimes I just want to check my balance. Sometimes I just want to make a very quick, frictionless payment. Other times I want to enjoy a four-course meal of banking. I want to sit down, engage with my financial advisor, look at my finances, and spend some time over it. So there's lots of different ways of interacting, lots of different mediums for doing that with. Sometimes it might not be even directly with my bank. It might be with a third party who's actually fronting some of those services that my bank's providing. And the underlying challenges, how do organizations today, how do banks today organize themselves, architect themselves, so they can service those very different user experiences? Because engagement is key, and we're gonna, I'm sure we're gonna hear that a lot today from people speaking, but how do you control that user experience so that your brand is serviced in the way you want it to? How do you take advantage of the context that you're understanding to make sure the security you're putting in place across those different services works? Is it different? Um, when someone is using a mobile phone at three in the morning in the city to, to check their balance or to make a payment versus someone who's doing it using voice in their car on their regular commute. That context is important. You can understand a lot more from that. So I think you have to organize the services you provide differently. You have to make them available in more consumable ways. But there's also an organizational change here. A lot of banks have moved from being very product-led and organizationally structured around the products to having a very channel-focused. And that's caused no end of heartache. But now the channel is no longer really the right way to look at things. And if you're trying to fund new projects that need to span these different interfaces, you actually have to find a way to do that. And, and the way is really around the customer. And this is probably at the heart of how a lot of the organizations I talk to are struggling with right now, is how to organize themselves around the customer, to break away from the silos that have been created around the channels or around the products and do it around the customer. So preparing for bite-sized banking is, is the first. The second, service with insight. Um, so insight, big data. Uh, this, is, this is the topic, right? This is analytics. How do we take advantage of data? Normally, when I'm talking to um, organizations, this ends up into the conversation of how do I send a more targeted offer to that client at the right point in time? How do I actually upsell or cross-sell to them? I would argue that actually sales is a big part of this, but actually it's service that's the most important thing. Right? And having a differentiated, improved, personalized service is what will win you business and retain loyalty of your customers. And you can do that by using the data from the inside. And I think this is where we will see organizations in the future really differentiating themselves by taking what they know about the customer, what they've learned, what the customer's made available elsewhere, and really making that available to target and personalize the service you provide. I'm gonna spend a couple of seconds talking about IBM Watson. For those of you who don't know it, it's a, some technology that IBM created around cognitive computing. It came to fame a few years ago when it won the US TV quiz show Jeopardy, and has since gone on to perhaps more worthwhile endeavors. Um, it's helping advise oncology doctors to treat and diagnose cancer patients. We're also using lots of other industries and including financial services. And as well as being something that organizations can use to provide advice to the wealth managers who will then go on, um, the relationship managers rather, who will then go on and provide wealth management advice to customers, we're really looking at it as well to see how it can provide improved customer service 
to everyone, to the everyday customer. And I think this is one area where you can look to really democratise how financial advice is provided to the masses. Right? So this is a very simplified example. So Melissa, customer for a bank, is using her banking app, and she has a question. She has a very simple question. How much will it cost to send my daughter to college? Now, traditionally, she might have to go into a branch to ask someone. She might ring someone up. She'd probably ask her dad, maybe in the old world. She might Google it, but she won't get a very specific answer. But using technology like Watson, which can understand natural language, so can really understand that question as she's phrased it. She hasn't had to think about framing it in the terms that the search or that Watson will understand. She's phrased it in a way that makes sense to her. Watson can do that. And then Watson has the power to look through both structured and unstructured data. And it can start looking through lots and lots of different sources of information. And by building up its knowledge base on all these different sources, and it can do this in seconds, it can actually combine that with information that is known about Melissa, because she's logged on, she's in the bank, knows she's from Texas, knows she has a two-year-old daughter, and pull that together to create a very specific, very personalised answer that makes sense to her. And it will show her where it's drawn the evidence from. So she can go and actually test that hypothesis, see if it makes sense, and drill down deeper. Now, it's one example, but it's an example of bringing that level of financial advice to everybody in a very low-cost way. And I think finding a way to provide enhanced service to people, I think, is a real game-changer for people. And, and putting it in their hands, in their smartphone, wherever they might be, when they need it, in a way that makes sense to them, is really where I think we're going to start to see a difference. So whether it's Watson or whether it's another means, I think service with insight is, is a, another key area we're starting to see an opportunity for change. But to do all these things, to come up with the good ideas, can you do it yourself? Do you as an organisation have all the good ideas? The answer, as we all know, is, is no. But actually, I think um, a lot of the more established banks still believe that they own the good ideas and what they know is probably the right answer. We've already talked about involving customers, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but I think there's also involving the wider ecosystem too, involving the industry and the developer ecosystem to see if they can help build and innovate on top of what you do. Now, this is probably motherhood and apple pie to a lot of the people in the room, right? People who are used to working in those ecosystems and actually sharing ideas. But for those of you who spend time with a lot of bigger banks, it's not always, certainly not in all areas of those banks, is it the case. So let's talk about customers first. I like this stat, it's an old stat, but 80% of CEOs think they deliver a good customer experience, right? Um, actually, I, I tend to read a lot of annual reports for when I go and see new customers. And pretty much always, the chairman or the CEO within one of the letters in the forward talks about customer experience, how it's at the heart of their business and how it's the key thing for them. But there's a corollary to this stat, which is only 8% of their customers actually agree. So, so there's a big disconnect here. Where's that come from? If I can give a real, a real example. So I, um, one of the banks I bank with, I downloaded uh, their, mobile, their new mobile banking app last year. And it was, it was fine. The experience was fine. Um, it did what I expected. Nothing stunning, but it did exactly what I expected. Two days later, in the post, in the physical post through my front door, I got a, an envelope containing a leaflet on how to use that app. How not to use the app, what to do should I lose my phone, and, and all sorts of... I, I realised I'd received a printed manual for a for mobile phone app. <laughs> I'd never seen such a thing. I, we, we talked to our UX designers in IBM, and we, you know, mobile is a manual-free world, right? That, that's... This was my first, this was the exception to the rule, I guess. But you can guarantee that customers weren't involved in that decision to send out that manual. Now, I'm pretty sure customers were involved in the creation of the app itself. They'd have seen the kind of the proof of concept diagrams, drawings. They'd have been involved in beta testing of it. But customers need to be involved in the end to end, everything you do in communications. And the other thing is, customers' voice needs to be loud enough. And I think sometimes that's a problem because virtually all organizations do customer testing now. But I'm not sure it's always. That voice is always heard and carried through. Why am I showing you a picture of Wimbledon? Well, it's topical, right? So Wimbledon's going on. Murray won yesterday, so we've all got a bit of a feel-good factor from that. Um, IBM's involved in Wimbledon. One of the things we do and have done this year is we've opened up some of the data sets, some of the match statistics performance of players in championships and put that out into a Wimbledon Innovation Challenge to allow the developer ecosystem to actually build on that, combine that data with social feeds, with weather, traffic, whatever it might be, to see if you can create a better experience um, for the fan, the person in the ground. 
we're not the only people who do this, but it's quite a big thing for IBM to start opening its doors to some of this data. And we've done it with the Watson. We've um, created the Watson Mobile Developer Challenge as well. But banks, their doors are a little bit heavier. They lock a little bit tighter, and they take a lot more effort to open them. So when I talk about opening doors, it, it sounds like it should make a lot of sense. But the established banks, they're naturally nervous and cautious about this. It's very, very against what they've done in the past. But it has to happen. If you are going to change and, be, and evolve as you need to, this has to happen. There are good examples out there. BBVA with its Innova Challenge, Credit Agricole has done some stuff around the CA store where it's opened up an app store for developers to build on. So people are doing this, and I think this has got to happen more and more. Because fundamentally, all organizations need to restlessly reinvent. Restless reinvention, I think this picks up on some of the themes we've talked about. The pace of change is just continuing to accelerate. And if you don't accelerate and change with it, and aren't able to change, then you're going to be stalled. And I think this is more difficult for the established financial organizations. And that's where the opportunity comes, right, from all the disruptors out there, because you can change, you can be more nimble. But they're not resting on their laurels, right? Established banks and other organizations are making changes. They are looking to drive new change. They are bringing in chief innovation officers. They are setting up spin-off digital banks to see how new ideas come. They're setting up accelerators like Barclays. We might hear about that a bit later. Um, and where they're funding startups and actually having them quite close so they can learn from them and bring that in. But it's got to be part of the mantra. You've got to look to constantly at your product mix. You've got to look at the services you offer. You've got to look at your organizational structure, the people you have, even your culture. Now, culture needs to be at the heart of organizations. And, you know, your values are your values. You shouldn't try and change those too much. But things do need to evolve as time goes forward. I mean, IBM is 100 years old, over 100 years old as a company. It's an IT company. There aren't many IT companies that have been around for 100 years. But we've only survived that long by reinventing ourselves. And, and by doing that, very significant moments um, as the world around us and IT has changed. But we are still having to do that. It's not something we've stopped on and something we're constantly having to challenge ourselves to do because we will get, if we don't keep in reinventing ourselves, we will be yesterday's news and we won't be relevant to the clients and to the industry. And that is definitely true of banks. And you won't be the chameleon. You'll be my friend, the two-headed snail. Right? And I think a lot of these points I put up, when I go and talk to organizations, they have people in their organizations who understand this, who are actually driving this and are fighting this cause. So they're this head on this side. They're pulling and saying, we want to go in this direction. We've got the future. We can see it. We can see where the role is for this bank. We can see how we can use our great customer base, our great presence, our great brand to do these great things and help change the world. But on the other side, you've got the other head. You've got the head that says, we've been around for 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 years. We've got organization, we've got process, we've got products that hasn't changed and hasn't needed to change. And actually, it's that reliability, that trustworthiness that keeps us where we are today. And these two, when they pull in the opposite directions, one of two things happens. <laughs> First is it doesn't move. The second, I'll leave you to imagine when it starts pulling itself apart. But you don't want to be the two-headed snail. And you, this is where you need to reinvent yourself. OK? So when I talk to clients and I talk about the future of the retail bank and I talk about where, what the next best thing is going to be in mobile, the conversation ultimately always comes and boils down into these areas because unless you prepare yourself for bite-sized banking, you're not going to be able to predict the future. You don't know what device is going to be the right answer, but you do know you're going to need to construct your services and your products in a way that can be consumed in different ways. You're not going to necessarily be the king of all service, but you've got a huge amount of information that you know about your customers. And there's a huge amount of information out there that they're willing to share and that you use. And if you combine those two to service and better, the sales will come. Um, and people are looking for good service now. They are looking for that experience, that engagement. You aren't the only people who can do this. Open your doors. Be a bit braver. Right? And that's, it does take a little bit of bravery. It takes a lot of strong leadership to be able to do this and actually have permission to do this. Um, but open your doors, listen to your customers, and also involve other people. But never stop. Keep going. Restlessly reinvent yourselves. Make sure you pay attention to all those bright young graduates who come into your organizations, um, or even if they haven't graduated, wherever they've come from, they bring a huge amount of ambition, intelligence, and ideas. And if you can harness that and give them permission, they can help challenge the status quo brilliantly. So that's all I was going to go through. Um, thank you very much for taking the time, and a very round day.
Gareth, you're in the front line of this friction-free moment of transition. <coughs> you're advising a lot of the incumbents on how they need to change. What do you notice in the leaderships of organizations that get it? And you, know, you can change names, but share some specifics. What do you see in the people who are going to make it through? So I think, I think the ones who are, I see really doing well are the ones who have strong leadership who believe in this. And, and as a result, they empower the team to go and take those ideas and take them forward. But it's, they're not just ideas that are, we're doing a little bit of innovation over here. That's great, we can talk to the press about it and we can show off what we're doing. But our main business is this and this is going to be our core. They're people who are actually using that to challenge the rest of their business and, and bring that innovation into the way they, they work across the organization. And, and investing kind of organizational change around that. So promoting up into kind of senior, other senior leadership positions, the people who have the belief and the ability to drive the business forward. I think the ones who are struggling are the ones, because all, all banks have got some bright, shiny thing they're doing. Right? We, we all see this. But the ones who are struggling are when it's just a bright, shiny thing, and they aren't actually looking at to transform their business. So that's the difference. Are there many CEOs of current listed banks that you think get it? I actually think there are more CEOs than you think who get it. Um, but I think there are many who are struggling to overcome the resistance within the organization, the demands of the shareholders and everything else to kind of drive some of the change that's needed. I'll leave a pause so you can name any names. No, and I haven't got any announcements at all either. IBM's not done any funding rounds for a while, so <laughs> I can't take that one through, unfortunately. They've got enough money. Thank you, Gareth. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.